In part five of lecture nine, we will discuss the working set model and other issues. The working set model is based on the idea that our process is working exclusively within a fairly limited area of memory and that at any given time, it will only need a few pages of code and data. Accordingly to this way of thinking, the best way to predict the next several page references is to take a look at the recent history of the program. We'll look back at the last delta page references, and these are the specific pages that we need in memory. This window delta is the working set window, and the pages that the window references are called the working set. The beauty of the working set model is that its size represents the pages that are actively in use. As we make more references to the same pages, the working set model requires fewer frames. As it makes more references to a variety of pages, it needs more frames. The only drawback is that it is difficult to keep track of the window because it's a moving target of sorts. It's changing several times with each instruction. We can come close by using an interval timer and a status bit. We'll set the status bit with each reference and have the timer interrupt every so often. Then we'll copy the status bits and clear them. The pages whose bits are set to one are within our window. The only problem is that it is quite expensive to compute all this. There is a more direct way to avoid thrashing. Keep the page fault rate within a certain range. As the graph shows, there is an inverse relationship between page fault rate and the number of frames. If the rate is too high, there are not enough frames allocated, and we increase the number of frames allocated. If the rate is too low, there are too many frames, and we are not using them to maximize throughput. So we will decrease the number of frames available. When a process starts running on a demand page system, none of its pages are in physical memory. As a result, there is a very high page fault rate at that point. And when processes resume after being blocked or suspended, we could have the same thing all over again. The easiest way to avoid this is to simply load back into memory the pages that we had in memory when the process was blocked or suspended. We can reload the pages in its working set and this would allow us to avoid the initial high page fault rate that we had at the beginning. Of course, there is a cost associated with this, loading pages that we may never use again. Whether or not this pays depends on the percentage of pages that we will reuse. The nearer to 100% it is, the better the deal prepaging is. While operating system designers have little control over page sizes, processor designers do. And one design parameter that must be chosen is page size. Choosing the right page size is not an easy task because there is no best page size. Nor are you always better off moving in one direction toward larger pages or smaller pages. Each offers advantages and disadvantages. Larger pages offer one main advantage. The larger the page size for a given address length, the smaller the number of pages, and therefore the smaller the page table will be. But larger pages lead to more internal fragmentation and wasted memory. Also, Smaller pages can be swapped in and swapped out more quickly. And this makes page fault handling a lot faster. The trend has been toward larger page sizes 
as page faults have been more costly. Therefore, it is considered a good idea to minimize them. Even in a demand paging system, there are some pages of memory that we always want in memory. A good example of this is a buffer for an input-output or secondary storage device. Having to reload these pages into memory could cause delays that are unacceptable. For this reason, we will lock the page. By setting the appropriate bit, we will prevent its being swapped out of memory when it is in use. This same technique can be used to ensure that a high priority process has the pages that it needs to complete execution. Of course, this creates a new problem, determining which are high priority and which are low priority. Real-time processing means that certain operations have very real time constraints in which they must be performed. Virtual memory makes it impossible to guarantee this. This does not necessarily mean just the space shuttle and elevator control panels, although they are clearly real-time systems. Sun's Solaris 2 allows both time-sharing and real-time computing. It allows processes to tell the system which pages are important enough to remain resident. Privileged users can even lock pages into memory. While this can be abused, it allows Solaris to do real-time processing, something that not all virtual memory systems can do.